Um, Professor Professor Sue, I have a question. Yeah, go ahead. Um, I'm, I'm Maria. I'm the volunteer. Um, is Doctor um, Professor Dila Dilalo not gonna be uh, an organizer today? Uh, he's my postdoc. I think okay. he's uh, somehow online. I think yeah, he's maybe okay. in attendees list. Yeah, but basically, uh, Kevin and I uh, will uh, host the uh, the workshop. So we are good. Okay. Yeah. Okay. How do you want us to test the uh, slide sharing? Yeah, you can try. Yeah. Okay. Maybe uh, I should uh, stop the sharing or? Yeah, I think you'll have to stop the sharing. Right. Do you want to go try it or y'all? I still don't have access. Who, oh. Doctor? Um... Yeah, I stopped the sharing. And uh, maybe Professor Batoli can try first Hi. because she's the first. Do you want to try your uh, screen sharing? Yeah, let me try. You shouldn't. OK. Can you see the slides? Uh, yes. yes, yeah. All right, so we're good. So I can stop sharing so others can try. OK, yeah. And then maybe, Xuanhe, uh, do you want to try your screen sharing? Our uh, Professor uh, Shrik Jin, can you try your screen sharing and our, and also your uh, audio? Okay, uh, let me trick it on here. Screen share. Good evening. <laughs> Hi, how are you? Good. Yeah, it's kind of late for you. Sorry for bothering. <laughs> uh, in the yeah, it's okay. Very late. <laughs> yeah. Uh, let me see. Where's my Oh, okay. I don't know what mode this is in. Yeah, this uh, can presentation you, mode. Can you uh, play it? Yeah. Yeah, I think uh, this is right mode. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Yeah, okay. Uh, Xuanhe, do you want to try? Okay, uh, maybe uh, yeah, just get started. Uh, maybe uh, Vikram after Katya finishes. Okay, Vikram, you, 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 Kevin, you want us to get started now? Yeah, I think yeah, I think we have. Uh, okay, yeah, yeah, I think it looks like we are good. Yeah, you have it. Yeah, yeah, we can see then. Uh, Let me try some videos. Whether you can see the videos. Yeah. Maybe uh, Professor Bangad can also try after uh, after this one. Can uh, we can video, see the video, right? but uh, no uh, sound. Uh, yeah, this does not have sound. OK, OK, cool, yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Let me stop. Professor Bangad, do you want to try your uh, screen sharing? Sure. <coughs> yeah, you can see it's uh, Google slide. OK, yeah, perfect, yeah. Good. Uh, uh, I think uh, you might be okay. Yeah, I think uh, maybe let's get started. Yeah. Okay. Uh, let's uh, rock and roll. Yeah. <coughs> 
Hey, uh, good morning or good evening. Uh, like, uh, let's get started and uh, basically welcome to today's uh, workshop, uh, which is part of the AIM 2020 uh, conference. And uh, our workshop is uh, challenges and opportunities of software robots, uh, robotics uh, workshop and research application and education. Uh, this uh, workshop is basically uh, organized uh, by Professor Kevin Chen, uh, my uh, postdoc Antonio Dilalo and myself. Uh, today, we have invited uh, a constellation of distinguished uh, speakers uh, in software robotics, uh, including Professor uh, Katia Bottoli from Harvard University, Professor Xuan He Zhao from MIT, Professor Gregory Shrikjian from uh, National University of Singapore and uh, Johns Hopkins University. Uh, the fourth speaker is myself. Then after that is uh, Kevin Chen uh, from MIT. Uh, Professor Vikram uh, Kapila from NYU. Uh, the next speaker is Professor Josh Bangar um, from University of Vermont, and he will talk about uh, uh, evolving the physical uh, structure of compliant software and biological robots. The next speaker is Professor uh, Shu Yang from University of Pennsylvania. And the last one is from uh, University, uh, is Professor Elliot Hawks from University of California, Santa Barbara some very unique uh, uh, software robot platform. Uh, we have like uh, more than 300 registered uh, attendees and uh, from more than, uh, I mean, 18 uh, countries. And uh, currently we have about uh, like uh, more than uh, 100 uh, attendees online. So I think uh, uh, even we cannot meet uh, in person in Boston, I think uh, we have a phenomenal number of attendees uh, to join this uh, exciting uh, workshop. So basically, uh, I think each speaker uh, will have like a 20 minutes talk and a five minutes for question and answer. And uh, the audience, please uh, uh, don't uh, interrupt the speaker. Uh, use, uh, please use the uh, chat box uh, to post questions. And uh, the host will help to you to ask the questions. And also please uh, mute uh, your audio. And uh, uh, we also have this uh, simultaneous uh, stream to YouTube for uh, for public uh, capacity. And uh, for the video recording, uh, mo uh, I think uh, uh, for the speakers who agree to post the video publicly, and we'll uh, post this uh, uh, in this week after the workshop. And uh, I think uh, let's uh, maybe, uh, yeah, I think uh, let's wait for one or two minutes and uh, let's uh, uh, welcome the first speaker. I think uh, Kevin, you can uh, start. Uh, Sure, of course, I'll, I'll, I'll yeah. take over. Um, so I will be uh, uh, introducing our first four speakers and Professor uh, Sue will introduce the last five speakers. So let's get started. Um, I want to introduce our first speaker, Professor Katia Bertoldi from Harvard. I personally, I did my PhD at Harvard and I had the opportunity to learn about several of her projects from her team members. So uh, Katia's lab takes a truly unconventional approach to study robotics. Her group exploits nonlinear behaviors on materials and structures to achieve new robot functionalities and use techniques such as kirigami to create complex structures. You know, there are many creative examples that's coming out of her lab. For example, you know, her group develops a kirigami skin for a simple soft actuator to crawl. You know, she also comes up with principles of using buckling or a mechanical instability to create folding patterns. She will be talking about uh, instability-driven soft robots today. So please join me in welcoming Katia. Katia, please take over. Thanks, Kevin. First of all, can you see my slide? Uh, yes, yeah, I can see Perfect. your slide. And you can also see the pointer, right? I can also see, sorry? You can see the pointer. Yes, yes, I can see the Perfect. pointer. And you, can you hear me? Yeah, I can hear you, great. Very good. All right, so thanks, Kevin, for the introduction. Thanks, everyone. First, thanks, uh, Hao and Kevin and uh, Antonio for organizing the workshop, and thanks, everyone, for joining. So in these 25 minutes, I want to tell you a bit about the work we are doing on instability-driven software robots. And uh, so first slide, not much. I think we can go very quick on those. So this talk, I will focus on fluidic soft robots. So these are very simple machines made of compliant material that uh, operate when they are inflated, so pressurized, under pressure. And they recently become very popular because they are inexpensive, they are easy to fabricate, 
and they are able to achieve complex output motion with relatively simple inputs. And since they are compliant, they are soft, they are also suitable for interacting closely with people. And here on the bottom, you can see some of the application they have been exploited for. So they have been used to design gripper, uh, rescue systems, somehow they move it on work, but I think you've seen this movie many, many times, and uh, medical devices. So clearly in the past, in the last few years, great progress has been made in the design of this robot, but there are still challenges, right, in the field. So here I want to list just few. First of all, energy and speed. So as I mentioned, this robot operate because of uh, require fluid to be transferred from a stationary source. And so this limit operation because we need to move fluid through small tubes. And also as a result, the system are typically tethered. And so this limit the range of application. Control, control is an open issue, not only for fluid is soft robots, right? Typically they are operate an open loop. But clearly we will, it will what we will ultimately need are also estimation of feedback control strategy, right? And finally, another issue with uh, fluid sub robot is sequencing. Typically, and here you can see an image of uh, one of these robots, you have many, many tubes coming out of this robot. And this is because each actuator <coughs> has to be inflated individually, addressed individually in order to achieve a desired motion. So now, the question we are asking in my group is, can we, can we use elasticity and more specifically elastic instability to improve the response of fluidic soft robot? So of soft robot power by pressurized fluid. This is a question we have been asking for a couple of, couple of years and just to make clear what I mean. So just to make everything clear. So what are elastic instability? Elastic instability are ubiquitous in a solid structure. Think a buckling of beams, buckling of shells. And typically, as engineers, we have been very, we have designed against instability. So we have been trying to avoid instability because we have associated the concept of instability to failure. And recently, what we have shown, not only my group, but also other groups around, we have shown that instability can also be harnessed at our advantage and can be also exploited to achieve new modes of functionality. And here you can see some examples that have been demonstrated in recent years, so for energy absorption, shape change, tunable optic, and, and even propulsion. So in this talk, I will focus on uh, three examples that we have been recently working on. First of all, I will focus on a robot that exploits buckling to achieve motion, then on a Kirigami snake robot that also based on buckling. And finally, on a soft band jumper inspired by, uh, by Shesna. So let's start focusing on the first project. So the goal here is to design a robot with legs that is capable of moving with a single input. As I mentioned at the beginning, typically, um, uh, real soft robots require multiple input to operate. And uh, so the... Um, the, if we want to move the legs, what means is that this, the, the pressure we apply needs to generate rotation. Typically, when we apply a pressure to this actuator, we achieve elongation or bending, but here we want to achieve rotation. How can we, and how can we do that? So here is a structure we started studying several years ago. It's a very simple system. What you see is a piece of rubber perforated with a square array of circular holes. And here, what you see is a test under, an, we're using an instrument to actually compress this, this, this simple structure. And what we see at a certain point, all these, the holes uh, go, form an array of uh, ellipsis, ellipsis perpendicular to each other. And you see that the domain in between the holes, you see that they start to rotate. You see here on the left, on the right. So what, and what we see here, why do we see this unique pattern emerging from the structure is because of backing. And what is interesting here is buckling induces the rotation of the square domain that separates the, the circular holes. Now, in the test I showed you before, we were using a, um, a, a force, we were applying a force in order to use the uh, in order to induce buckling, but this is not required. So now, unfortunately, this movie is not playing. So let me try. It was playing yesterday evening, and now it says it cannot play media. Let me try a few things. Well, weird. So 
Here you are supposed to see the same identical motion, but in this case, what we are doing, we are depressurizing the structure. In this case, the, there is a signing membrane that makes the structure airtight, and then uh, what we are doing, we are inputting and outputting air, and we see this exactly the same pattern transformation. Here the problem propagate. So let's see. Ah, we are in trouble because the movie don't play. Let me try to see if I have another. Uh, it was playing yesterday evening when I try, and now nothing play. Let me try to restart. Sorry, never yeah. argue. Uh, take your time. Uh, if, yeah, if you want to unshare your screen and find us some local video, yeah, that's also okay. Yeah, if you, you prefer. So let's see, because if the issue propagate all movies, it's an issue. Yeah, I think it always happens. I me. mean, one movie is okay, but if all movies don't work, <laughs> it's a yeah. big issue. Yeah, we still have some time. Yeah, take your. Yeah, okay, now we go. Yeah. Yeah. Good. Perfect. Good, good, good. Perfect. Result. Yeah. Some weird issue with PowerPoint. I have no idea what happened. Okay, so let me try to share screen. Yes, now everything works. Good. Was worth the two minutes. So all right, so you see now that exactly when we basically pressurize, the pressurize, we get exactly the same motion. And now the question is now what we can do. So you see that the square between the holes rotate. And now what we can do, we can decorate, we can attach legs and arms to those rotating square. And now you can see we get a, a tiny machine that is able to move forward when we pressurize and depressurize. Or we can even attach arms and now we have a robot that is able to grab to grab object or even to swim around. So this was the first, our first um, attempt to use backlink to, um, to achieve, to enable functionality in soft robots. Then after that, we, we started, after this, uh, this first uh, exercise, we also started thinking about other strategy to enable motion with very simple input. And so we started focusing on the simplest possible Actuator we can think of. So this is a linear soft actuator. So it's a basically a tube made of made of ecoflex. And what you see, there are fibers wrap around to basically make sure that all the energy goes into elongation. Now what you see is when we inflate and deflate, this actuator expand, contract, but you see it doesn't move, and there is no reason for this actuator to move to move because there is nothing breaking symmetry. So now the question we started asking is, can we make this simple actuator to crawl? And uh, what do we need? Well, first of all, we need pretty much to break symmetry at the interface between the actuator and the surface, right? So we, in principle, what we need is a stretchable skin because we need to maintain stretchability with anisotropic frictional properties. So how can we design this? Um, such a skin. Here we took inspiration from Kirigami Mesamaterial. These are very simple systems that are realized by embedding cuts and folds into a flat sheet. And uh, what has been shown in the past five, 10 years is that they provide an ideal platform to the design of stretchable devices. And here you can see some examples of a transistor that's conducting nanocomposite, shape changing material, and even a tweet. So, and I aspect of this system is that they, um, they can also go from flat, you fabricate them flat, but then by applying the formation, they can also take 3D morphologies. And um, so here are the pattern we explore. So we basically, what we did, we took a, a plastic sheet and then we embed a linear array of cut, a triangular array of cut, circular array of cut, and trapezoidal um, array of cut. And uh, in all the first four, um, four patterns, you can see that the, the cuts are all pointing in the same direction, but we also have a version where half of the cuts are pointing in one direction, the other half in the other. And um, 
And here you can see the, um, the response we observe when we start. First, we stretch it. We tested this uh, sample under uniaxial tension. And here you can see the response we observe. So if you look at the stress strain curve here on the top uh, left, what you see, all of them initially, there is a linear response, then there is a plateau, and then there is, there is first, they stiffen if you keep stretching. And the interesting point is this plateau corresponds again to an instability. And in this case, the instability leads to a formation of a 3D texture, a 3D morphology. And what is important to note is that for, for three of these, uh, for uh, three of these pattern, you can see that for most of this pattern, all the features point in the same direction. Instead, for the pattern with linear cut, some of the features popping up and some of the features are popping down. So now, how can we use this simple method, this simple Kirigami, to enhance the functionality of our actuator? So here is our idea. We have the actuator I showed you before. And now what we, ca we can use this Kirigami as a skin. So we wrap it around. And then what happens is when we inflate the actuator, the actuator is pushing on the cut. And so it's stretching the, the skin. And so the feature of the skin, the idea are popping up, and these are going to modify friction. So here you can see the performance of our actuator. So here you can see that the actuator, the naked actuator, no skin on the top, and then the actuator with the different skin on the, um, on the bottom going down. And what we can see is that the first actuator doesn't move. And then the, the linear actuator doesn't move much. And the last four, you see that they were moving quite a bit. With the, fa the trapezoidal one, or the bottom one, the most efficient one was the one moving fur the further. So uh, why is that? How can we explain this response? So it's, the skin seems to work. Now let's try to understand why. So what we do, we measure the frictional properties of our skin. So here you can see the simple test, the setup that we use to measure the skin. You see the filter, we inflate it up to a certain point, we close the valve, and then we push and we pull, and we, and we measure the, the force required to push and pull. So here you can see. First of all, a snapshot of the skin when the system is uninflated, when the actuator is in the initial state and when it's fully inflated. So initially, you can see the skin is flat, is smooth. And then what we can see when it's full, the actuator is inflated, we see that for the triangular circular trapezoidal pattern, we see that this, there are these features popping up. We see for the linear pattern, the, the skin is still smooth. And this is because, if you remember, the buckling pattern for the skin with linear cuts some features were popping up, some are popping down. This buckling mode is prevented by the actuator because now it, this feature cannot anymore buckle down. So the, as a result, nothing buckles. So the structure and the surface remain smooth. So here are the, here you can see the frictional properties now that we measure. So these are for the, for the structure with uh, that they that don't exhibit buckling induced pop-up. So what we see is that the, the crawler slides smoothly, smoothly in both directions, both when we pull when we, and when we push. And when the system is before inflation and fully inflated. Now we can see that the response is remarkably different when instead we have the skin with triangular, circular, and trapezoidal. So we see that we, before inflation, so the plot on the left, Everything is the same. So we have this, we record this very smooth force, both when we pull and when we push. But we see that the situation is different when this, the actuator is inflated and when we are uh, pulling. Because in this case, all this scale basically offer resistance. And now what we see, we see a sort of a jerking motion and we see this very sharp dropping force that are basically, and these are, and so that means that the, the now the, um, our actuator undergoes a sort of a stick and slick mode, type of mode. And, um, and finally, we have the, um, the last skin, that is the, the skin with the mirror cut. In this case, we have uh, cuts pointing both in uh, forward and backward. And what we see is when the system is inflated in this time, we observe this peak uh, with dropping force, both when we push and when we pull because we have basically this uh, feature popping up in both directions, all right? 
So, and now what we can do, we can also basically from this data that we collected, we can also extract efficient, efficient, effective coefficient of friction. So we simply divide the peak force by the normal force. And what we see is that if there is no buckling induced pop up, the frictional, the effective coefficient of friction is constant and it's identical when we push and when we pull. When we have this symmetric pop up pattern, we see at a certain point the coefficient of friction start to, pop up, uh, start to pick up after basically buckling, but we see that it's identically for the two directions. And instead, we see that when we, when we have a symmetric pop up, then what we are able to engineer is an asymmetric coefficient of friction because we see that the coefficient of friction after, back, after buckling is very becomes very large in the forward direction but very uh, very sorry become very small in the forward but very large in the backward direction, the backward direction. and so this the fact that we are able to basically achieve an isotropic frictional, uh, an isotropic frictional property, enable our simple actuator to move. Now, if you remember from the movie, we also saw that the trapezoidal was the most efficient, was the one that was able to travel further. And this is because in order to move, we need an isotropic frictional property, but we also want the actuator to move as much as possible, to elongate as much as possible. And it turned out that the um, actuator with the um, trapezoid, the trapezoid, uh, uh, the the scheme with the trapezoidal cut is the one that elongates the most. And so now here you can see, so we were also able in this case to put the, um, the pump and the control on board. So we were also able to make our uh, very, very slow crawler to move on Harvard campus. Good. So as you can see here, our actuator is quite low, right? And this is a, a feature typical of um, fluidic soft actuator. Typic this is mostly because the energy landscape of the system is typically quite smooth and monotonic. And it's very similar to that of a balloon. And here you can see the, um, the response, the analytical response that you can calculate for a spherical balloon made of an eulucan material. And as a result, the actuator has low because a significant amount of fluid has to be transferred and supplied for their operation. And the, the influx of this fluid is restricted by viscous forces because there are tubes and there are valves. So a question we asked recently is, how can we make this actuator move fast and even jump? How can we make this actuator jump? And here we got inspiration by shell snapping. So here what you can see is a finite element simulation for a thin shell. And what we are doing, we are pressurizing the shell. And what you can see is initially there is a linear elastic response, but at a certain point you see that there is a, a sudden jump. And this corresponds to a, a snapping instability that is a bit that has been known for a very long time in the, within the mechanical uh, mechanics community. Now, what is interesting we observe is that this instability is also associated with an energy release. And now the question we ask is, can we harness this energy release to make this actuator jump? So here is our simple actuator. So what we have, we have two spherical cups, with one in, an inner cup and an outer cup, one internal, the other external, and these two cups define an inflatable cavity. So we have several, we have few para geometric parameters defining our system. And to begin with, what we do, we focus on three designs. So you see design A, design B, that is identical to design A, but you see it has a thicker inner cup. And then design C, dimensions are identical to those of design B, but we use a softer rubber to fabricate the outer cap. And now here are on top, you can see the schematic. On the bottom, you can see the picture of the sample we fabricated. And to fabricate, we use elastomeric rubber. So here you can see that we started simulating the response of the systems. And here, let's see the movie. The movie. So here you can see the response of the three actuators as predicted by numerical simulation when we, when we inflate the internal cavity. So you see initial in a response, then suddenly there is a drop. And what you can see, and you see that the inner cap snap out. And what you see is also there is an, uh, what we can find in all three, there is also an energy release associated to the instability. And what we can see 
is that is larger for the third design. So now here are the, uh, the edition of our finite element simulations. Now we also went to the lab, and uh, here you can see the energy release. Then we also went to the lab, we fabricated and we tested, and what we see the red line now are the experiments. And now what we can see is very, this very good agreement between experiment and simulation. So the numerical simulation were, um, were conducted, uh, conducted using RIGS. So the RIGS algorithm is able to track the full PV curve. Experimentally, we cannot track the, some part of the curve because this is unstable. So what you see in the experimental curve, you see a jump. And, um, and here you can see a snapshot taken during from our experiment. And what we can see again, there is this uh, at the jump. What we can see when there is this jump impression, the outer cap snap and basically invert this curvature. So the experiment, the red curve corresponds to experiment with water, but also when we inflate with air, we, very, we see very similar behavior. And so now after the question is, can we exploit this instability for functionality? So here you see the three, the three sample. And now here what we are doing, we are inflating them very slowly with air. And what we see is that in the first two cases, the, for the two green actuator design A and design B, when they, they snap, when there is this instability, the, out, the inner cap invert curvature, but they remain on the table. Instead, now you can see design C. This instability makes this actuator to jump. It's jumping, but not that much, you can also see. So now the question is, how can we, how can we improve the the response can we make this a two, can we harness this instability to make this actuator to jump more so what we want to do we want to do so we want to study the effect of geometric parameters and what we did we use axisymmetric finite element simulations to be efficient and we started by studying the response of the inner cap and the outer cap separately so here you can see the the result of some finite element simulation when we vary the geometric parameter of the inner cap. And uh, we assume that the inner cap is pressurized. And what we see is that all these uh, all these caps are characterized by this unusual PV curve that is, uh, that is associated to snapping instability. This is the response that we predicted by our finite element simulation for the outer cap. And in this case, we can see that the response is similar to that of an inflated balloon. So it's much more linear. So now here is a summary of all the result for the inner cap on the left and for the outer cap on the right as a function of the normalized radius and polar angle. So the opening angle and the, th the, um, the basically the normalized thickness of our shells. And uh, the color pixel for the inner pole, for the inner cap, the color pixel are the identified the configuration for which snapping is achieved, where basically we have snapping. So for the inner cap, what we are interested in, we want this, we want to basically maximize the energy release. We also want to maximize the pole displacement because we want the pole to touch the ground and then jump. For the outer cap, what we want, we want this outer cap to store as much energy as possible because that it can release this energy when the inner cap snap. So, so guided by this um, observation and by this simulation, now we can use the simulation to identify the region where we want to focus on. So in this region here are highlighted in, uh, in yellow and are the region that maximize energy release and pole displacement and maximize for the inner cap and maximize store, uh, the store energy for the outer cap. And, um, and now what we can do, we can use finite element simulation to basically simulate the response of for, uh, for um, almost 5,000 5, actuators constructed by combining the inner and outer cap within the identified promising region. So first, we, de we basically simulate separately the inner and the outer cap, we identify promising region, and then we simulated all the actuator constructed by combining inner and outer cap from this promising region. So here you see the actuators, the three initial actuators. And now here you can see the result in terms of energy release and pole displacement for all the actuator we basically Simulate, and what we can see is that we can clearly increase the response. increase the response when the geometry is properly tuned. Now, here the 
purple marker corresponds to the design in which the outer cup is, uh, is softer than the inner cup. The green marker corresponds to the design in which outer cup and inner cup are made by the same material. And we can say that the both energy release of pole displacement are significantly larger for actuator with a more a flexible outer cap. Another interesting point here, the, um, the marker that are um, with a black uh, contour are the one in which the inner cap is the one that maximizes uh, its energy release. So what we learn from here is that by choosing the inner cap to maximize the energy release, we can significantly improve the response of the actuator. And uh, one final remark is that for the best design, so the design that have both large energy release and large pole displacement, you see that the dropping pressure can be very, very small. But the area enclosed by the PV curve between the um, between the isochoric, uh, the, um, the isochoric point, between the limit point and the isochoric point on the lower branch is large. So this tells us that this is crucial to run simulation because we cannot just use the dropping pressure to, to basically quantify how much energy is released by the system. And, um, and so now, okay, we, we were able to use finite element to quantify the energy release, the pole displacement, but now the question is, what we want to know is how much do these actuator jump? And so to predict how much this actuator jump, we establish a very simple uh, spring mass model that take the finite element result as input. Our finite element results are static simulation, so they don't give us any information on uh, jumping height. So what we do, we have the PV curve, and now what we come up is a simple mass spring model. And the two masses are chosen equal to the masses of the inner outer cap and are located at the corresponding pole. And then we make some assumption. We assume that the energy the system store an amount of energy equal to the energy that is released by the actuator. And, um, and we assume that the spring is initially pre-compressed to store the, this uh, energy. And then the system is released. And here you can see a simulation, a very simple simulation. This is basically a two degrees of freedom mass spring system. But we can use that to predict the, um, the jump, the height of the jump. And uh, here you can see now the same, the same uh, plot I showed you before, but now the color corresponds to the jump height as predicted by, the, um, by uh, our simple mass spring model. And what we see is that the actuator with the highest uh, with large energy release and large, uh, and large pole displacement are also characterized, but we are expected also to ju jump the IS. And so now we go, we pick up the, um, the, the best actuator from this plot, and now we fabricate and we test, and now what you see on the left is our initial design, design C, what you see on the right is the, opt the optimized actuator, and now what we are doing, we are inflating, and now they're jumping. And now you see that really we, we got much better. And again, and we, have, we kept our parameter speed quite limited. So both kappa spherical, and we only use two materials. So really we can get much better if we go, if we further expand our uh, design uh, space. And so here to snapshot of our actuator. And uh, one final remark is that in this case, we are pressurizing and depressurizing, so this actuator can jump multiple times. It's very easy to reset, right? We just depressurize through vacuum, and then it can take off rapid, uh, many, many times. So, so this is my pretty much the, my last slide. So I hope you, I convince you that elasticity can be harnessed to enhance the response of soft robots, most, uh, more specifically fluid soft robots, and uh, make them move faster and make them move with when using a si also simplify their control because they are only using a basically sim single input. And um, yeah, and I would like to thank uh, all collaborators. So George uh, and uh, George Weiser and Gigansu for the first project, Amal Fajani and uh, Shmuel Robinstein for the second project on the Kirigami scheme. And unfortunately, David uh, and uh, Ben disappeared. So there was some issue with, um, yeah, with the PowerPoint for the last project on the inflatable uh, soft jumper. And here you can see the three paper where you can find more detail about the three projects I discussed. Thanks.
Okay, cool. Um, okay, great. Thanks, Katia. It has been a really interesting talk. Um, so we have one short question from the audience, and they asked about the actuation frequency of the Kirigami crawling robot. I, I, so I guess, just to be more complete, have you thought about how fast the Kirigami crawling robot works as a functional actuation frequency of the soft robot? Yeah, so pretty much, we, we haven't focused on that at all. Okay. And uh, and we were quite, as you notice we were quite slow. Mm -hmm. So the, and that for that study we were more uh, we were focusing mostly on the principle. So I think the problem anyway the problem is not the kirigami the, is that we, the, the limiting factor for that specific is the actuator and the, we have a very long tube very tiny tube and it was taking forever to to inflate it. Okay. So the kirigami can respond quite quickly. So the kirigami is not the limiting factor. What if you have an actuator that is able to respond reasonably quickly, the, the Kirigami is going to be fine. I see. So it's really the actuator, not, not, not the skin. It's not that, the, that the limiting the factor is the actuator, it's not the skin. The skin is not limiting at all the, the speed. Okay, great. Thank you. I, I think uh, our time is up. Um, so let's thank Katia again. Um, again, it's a super interesting talk. It's great to see how Katia took this very unconventional approach to studying robotics. Um, so, um, yeah. Thanks, so I stopped sharing that. Yeah, so thanks Katia. And again, if you have questions, uh, please um, leave your question uh, in the chat and uh, all the videos or uh, we're, we're, we're gonna try to post uh, all the videos afterwards.